Hey guys, today we're talking about autosclerosis, it's also known as autospongiosis. But before we dig deep into autosclerosis, we need to learn the anatomy of the labyrinth and we need to get familiar, fam, uh, familiarized with the terminologies. So first, we have the otic labyrinth or the membranous labyrinth. Okay, membranous labyrinth. So in this figure, you can see it is the orange colored part, which is the membranous labyrinth. You have the it was, uh, we have the semicircular canals, okay, utricle, saccule, cochlear duct, okay, everything is considered under the membranous labyrinth. So it is the innermost part of the labyrinth, okay, and it consists of endolymph. We have endolymph in the membranous labyrinth, okay. Then we have the periotic labyrinth. Basically, it is the space between bony and the otic labyrinth, and it consists of perilymph okay so what are the parts of the periotic labyrinth it is the vestibule okay the uh, scalar tympani scalar vestibuli okay so everything is considered into the periotic labyrinth then we have the otic capsule or the bony labyrinth here is the outermost part of the labyrinth it is a protective cover okay now it has three parts first one is the endoostial layer Second one is the enchondral layer and it's the periosteal layer. And endosteal layer is the innermost layer. Okay. Innermost layer. And it lines the bony labyrinth. And chondral layer is what makes the bony labyrinth. Okay. It is first cartilage, then it can convert it into bone. Okay. And then we have the periosteal layer, which just covers the bony labyrinth. Outermost and covers the bony labyrinth. Okay. So there are about 14 centers, okay, 14 centers of ossification from where the otic capsule ossifies. So it is a quick MCQ that you need to remember. There are 14 centers of ossification for the otic capsule to ossify. Okay, so the exact etiology of exact etiology or the exact cause of autosclerosis is not known, but what we know is that uh, one or more foci of irregularly laid spongy bones that replaces the part of normally dense endochondrial layer okay of the bony otic capsule now as i said the endochondrial layer is consisting the entirety of the bony labyrinth okay it makes the bony labyrinth so first of uh, there was cartilage and it later oxidifies to form bone okay but there are some areas in the endochondrial layer where the cartilage remains cartilage okay remains cartilage for entirety So for entire life and it leads to autosclerosis this is the site of autosclerosis okay from where the autosclerosis originates so what are the types of autosclerosis now when we say autosclerosis we are referring to stepidal autosclerosis which is the most common variant but there is also cochlear autosclerosis which may involve any region of the uh, otic capsules or the region of the region near the round window okay and it may lead to sensorineural hearing loss there's also a histologic uh, autosclerosis variant which remains asymptomatic. So let's discuss more about stepidal autosclerosis. Now the site of origin, as I said, there are certain part of the endochondrial layer where it remains cartilaginous throughout life. And this site is known as fissula antifenestrum. Okay. Now from this side, there is formation of new spongy bones okay which replaces the dense endochondrial layer so it can be different uh, depending on the location it can be anterior focus okay it can be posterior focus okay it can only involve the margin and not in involve the foot plate itself so it can be marginal marginal slash circumferential okay or it can do the opposite, it involves the entirety of the foot plate but not the margins, okay, and not the annular ligaments. It is called the biscuit type. Okay, or it can just involve the entirety of the uh, foot plate along with the margin, it's called the obliterative type. Okay, so certain things that we need to know about osclerosis that is. Autosom autosomal dominant trait and females are twice susceptible than men because there is a 
2 is to 1 ratio of getting ill then it is most commonly seen in the third decade of life basically you don't get to see it before 20 years of age and you don't get to see it after 30 40 40 years of age okay so basically it is from 20 to 30 and uh, the pregnancy and the measles infection are aggravating factors for otosclerosis okay just you just, you just need to remember that pregnancy and measles may lead to aggravation of the otosclerosis okay and otosclerosis often um, seen with osteogenesis imperfecta so the triad of osteogenesis imperfecta where there is multiple fractures and otosclerosis along with blue sclera is called van der Hughes syndrome okay it is a triad where we see person has suffering from multiple fractures has otosclerosis and blue sclera okay it is also an mcq mcq question so you need to remember that now what are the clinical features that a patient presents to you with otosclerosis okay now there is hearing loss of course and it's often bilateral hearing loss it is conductive in nature conductive hearing loss is there and it's slowly progressive in nature okay it develops slowly and is progressive and the patient presents with a certain phenomenon as is called as paracusis velocity that means the patient hears better in noisy surrounding okay there is a paradoxical hearing that is better in the noisy surrounding now why does it happen it is simply because in noisy surrounding the patients or uh, these uh, in noisy surrounding the person who is talking to the patient tends to speak in a louder of noise okay when they are speaking louder the patient hears better and he thinks that they can hear better in the noisy surrounding okay now similarly the patient is suffering from conductive hearing loss so he may hear his own speech to be very high in uh, high in loudness so he speaks in a monotonous way in a well modulated soft speech okay you can just uh, try this by uh, pressing your tra uh, triggers on your I mean just close your ears and try to speak okay so when you speak you will hear that your sounds are louder than what you are actually speaking so the same thing happens with the patient with autosclerosis they have uh, they think that they are speaking very loudly so they speak very softly and they have a very monotonous speech okay there may be tinnitus and it is most commonly seen in cochlear autosclerosis on examination of the tympanic membrane we usually see a pearly white tympanic membrane and it's uh, the and is seen in the mature cases and is the most common thing that we can see in autosclerosis but in some cases where there is immature or active cases of autosclerosis we see a flamingo pink tympanic membrane and this sign is called as Schwartz sign remember we have talked about it in the early video that is not the Schwartz procedure it's a Schwartz sign okay so on tuning fork test we say get to see that Rennie's is negative suggestive of conductive hearing loss okay Weber's later as to the worst year absolute bone conduction is normal Schaubach's is lengthened and Gallis is negative on pure tone audiometry we get to see that there is a AB gap okay there is a AB gap right there is a AB gap and this suggests conductive hearing loss okay and we see there is a dip at 2000 hertz in the bone conduction okay bone conduction wave is known as the Kahat's notch okay it's characteristic of autosclerosis whenever you see Kahat's notch you can see that the patient may be suffering from autosclerosis okay now why do we only get a dip in the frequency at 2000 Hertz okay now this happens because normally when there is bone conduction the entirety of the bony labyrinth along uh, uh, along with the foot, foot plate of stapes get vibrated okay and it stimulates the cochlea okay vibration coming from the bony vibrate uh, bones of the skulls and the mastoid and everything okay bony labyrinth is vibrating and it conducts the vibration to the cochlea okay this is membranous labyrinth and this is the bony labyrinth okay so if even if there is a fixation of the stapes superstructure and the foot plate of stapes okay it doesn't matter okay because rest of the uh, bony labyrinth is vibrating but when the frequency reaches 2000 hertz 
which is specific frequency specific frequency of stapes basically this uh, the frequency which at which this stapes uh, structure moves okay at this 2000 hertz when there is fixation of this uh, stapes stapes foot plate okay it doesn't move and when it doesn't move what it usually normally does is that it vibrates and it stimulates the bony labyrinth and we hear better but since it is fixated it doesn't move it doesn't vibrate and we see a dip in the bone conduction okay so the reason is 2000 hertz is the specific frequency of stapes and when it is fixated it doesn't move it doesn't vibrate and we don't hear at 2000 hertz so we see a dip in the bone conduction okay then when we do impedance audiometry okay impedance audiometry we have to do two things okay tympanometry and stability reflex okay Sta tympanometry and stability reflex together is known as impedance audiometry so sta uh, stability reflex is gone because due to the fixated foot plate of stapes okay and on tympanometry you get to see a uh, as type of curve that is known as a sclerotic type of curve because there is fixation of the say piece of foot plate and it is not vibrating so there is sclerotic type of curve now when is so now let's talk about the management of autosclerosis okay so if we go for a medical management there is no specific medical management we have to give sodium fluoride okay sodium fluoride in cases where there is active autosclerosis or immature case of autosclerosis it basically stops the destruction of the bone and increases the bone maturation okay once there is a mature case and when we examine the tympanoscope uh, sorry tympanic membrane you see a pearly white tympanic membrane we can opt for either of these surgeries which are stepidectomy or stepitotomy okay in stepito uh, stepidectomy we remove entirety of the stapes along with the foot plate of stapes okay but in stepidotomy we remove the suprastructure of the stapes and we create a small hole in the foot plate of stapes okay now we prefer stepidotomy because it has lower chances of fistula formation okay lower chances of fistula formation so it is a preferred method but you can do either of the method it doesn't it just depends on the surgeon okay after removing the stapes we re uh, replace it with a uh, Teflon processes okay nowadays we have platinum Teflon pistons or titanium Teflon pistons okay so we have to replace it with the Teflon processes now which ear do we operate on first okay since it is a risky operation and there is chance that the surgery may not be uh, very beneficial for hearing we do the operation first in the worst ear okay then we observe for any complications for about one year. If there is no complication for one year, we can do the surgery on the other ear also. Okay, so we have to operate on the worst ear first. What are the post-operative complications? Now there are tons of post-operative compli uh, post complications. There can be tearing of the tympanic membrane, and there can be vertigo and any other um, complication that is related to the middle ear. But due to the surgery itself, there can be conductive hearing loss due to the fixation, that is recurrence of the autosclerosis. There can be dislodged prosthesis, and since there is no stapes, the person may not hear, it is conductive hearing loss. There can be necrosis and erosion of the incus, okay, because there is the malleus, there is incus, okay, and you have put the prosthesis like this, okay. Now, since the incus and its long, uh, long process is more susceptible to erosions and necrosis, there is risk of necrosis and erosion of the incus. Okay, we can see perilymph fistula or granulomas, and in two percent of the cases where there is operation, it may lead to sensorineural hearing loss as well. So that's all about autosclerosis.